Welcome to Case Review Ultrasound of Complete Molar Pregnancy. I'm Dr. Dan Koval from Radiologist Headquarters, and I'm excited to announce that this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images that I'm about to show you were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige Ultrasound Unit. Let's take a look at the case, and I'll review key teaching points at the end. All right, this was a patient that presented to the emergency department with an enlarged uterus and an estimated gestational age by last menstrual period of a bit over 12 weeks. However, her beta-HCG level was markedly elevated at 800,000, so normally at 12 weeks, the maximum beta-HCG would be much less than 300,000. So we're starting here with a transabdominal image of the uterus in transverse plane, and you can see the endometrial cavity is extended here with this echogenic material, and it contains these small cystic spaces that are causing increased through transmission. It's brighter posterior to this region, which is typical for ultrasound beams when they hit fluid. And as we move through the uterus on these transverse images, we don't see any normal fetus, which is important to identify. We do see the uterus is quite enlarged. It measures 13 centimeters on transverse. And on this transverse cine clip, you can see how thickened this endometrial cavity is. And as we study it carefully, we don't see any normal fetus, but we do see these multiple little cystic areas diffusely throughout it. We see some normal myometrium extending as a small rind of tissue around this markedly distended cavity. Moving on to the sagittal images, the uterus is severely enlarged, about 19 centimeters in length. Here's the uterine fundus up here, the body, and then the lower uterine segment. And the endometrial cavity is markedly thickened. It measures nearly six centimeters, and we're seeing some scattered areas of vascular flow within it. But again, we don't see any normal fetus. We just see this expanded endometrial cavity with all these small cystic spaces now we're looking at transvaginal images, and here's the transducer tip at the cervix, and then lower uterine segment here expanding out. You can see this thin rind of myometrium, and then this is all that heterogeneous echogenic material within the endometrial cavity. Note how we don't see the fundal region quite as clearly on these transvaginal images because of the increased distance from the transducer, but we do get a great look at the echo texture of this area within the lower uterus, and you can again see these multiple little cystic areas all clustered together, and just this heterogeneous echogenic material and as we zoom in here, you can see these cystic areas quite well, and you can see why this is sometimes referred to as a cluster of grape appearance. And when we add color Doppler, you see scattered areas of vascular flow within this area of thickened endometrial cavity. If we were to apply spectral Doppler, you'd expect to see a low resistance waveform. And finally, on the transverse cine clip, you can see no normal fetus, just these multiple little cystic areas diffusely throughout the mass with this posterior acoustic enhancement. All right, let's review some key points for molar pregnancy, and you can also find these in the episode show notes. So these are also known as hydatiform moles, which are the most common form of gestational trophoblastic disease. The less common form is gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, or GTN, and that's composed of invasive moles and choriocarcinoma. And molar pregnancies are fairly common. Approximately 1 out of 1,000 pregnancies is actually a molar pregnancy. Some of the risk factors are related to patient age, so we see them more commonly under age 20 and over age 35. This patient was in her early 20s. And there's two types, the complete, which is the most common, and which we saw in this case, and then also the partial type. So the complete type has a diploid chromosomal pattern composed of paternal DNA only, and you won't see any normal fetus, and it's more likely to be complicated by gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. So these patients need to be followed closely. The less common type is the partial type. That's usually a triploid chromosomal makeup, which is composed of maternal and paternal DNA. And you'll actually see some abnormal fetus or even fetal parts. This is more difficult to diagnose. Part of the problem is that these can overlap with the appearance of a miscarriage in process and even retain products of conception. I should also mention that very rarely molar pregnancies can actually coexist with normal pregnancies and you can even have an ectopic molar pregnancy. So make sure you study the uterus and adnexa closely. Now how do these complete hydatiform moles present? Well, typically they'll be vaginal bleeding, an enlarged uterus inconsistent with dates, and even hyperemesis. And classically, you'll have markedly elevated beta-HCG levels. Again, in this case, it was around 800,000. The problem, though, with partial molar pregnancies is that's variable. You might have a HCG that's closer to normal, which, again, makes it more difficult to diagnose those partial molar pregnancies. You might also get these functional large thecaludean cysts within the ovaries due to ovarian hyperstimulation from this markedly elevated beta-HCG level in a complete molar pregnancy. And those will be large cysts that are arranged in a spoke wheel pattern throughout the ovary. But these are actually uncommon. We only see these in less than 20% of complete moles. And this patient actually had normal ovaries. So on ultrasound, we're looking for this heterogeneous echogenic mass expanding the endometrial cavity and giving us almost a snowstorm appearance. And within that snowstorm, you'll see these small little anechoic cystic spaces, as we saw in this case, giving you a cluster of grapes appearance. And that's due to these hydropic chorionic villi. 
The treatment is typically dilation and keratage to preserve fertility, usually under ultrasound guidance to limit the risk of uterine perforation. After the procedure, it's important to monitor beta-HCG levels until they're no longer detectable, because that's how you can confirm that there's no residual disease, such as gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. All right, thank you for joining me for a complete molar pregnancy, and thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, please subscribe to the video podcast or on YouTube. To see bonus teaching material posted throughout the week, click the YouTube community tab or follow us on social media. Until next time, remember, radiology is life.